Welcome, Joe Heath. Thank you. We're going to start with a short video um, because it's so much better than any words that I could put together. This was done by a, a very creative drone artist, and um, I knew better than to talk during it. So it's about uh, a little less than six minutes. So I'm going to just turn on one of the lights. So. Much better. Yeah. This is actually the mud boils, and we'll talk about those some. These are not in the acre, but they're related. Thank you. 
So I think you could see that it's just a really beautiful land. It has waterfalls. And the other thing that I think is important to understand from that video is um, it looks like the Finger Lakes because the Onondaga Valley is a dry Finger Lake. That's how geologists and hydrogeologists refer to it. You go one hill from the west, uh, the Tully Valley, that's a Tisco. Uh, and it's just that the glacier acted differently here. Uh, I shouldn't talk to them at the same time. <clears throat> this is a different setup. Do you want to run them through as a presentation? I want to do the slideshow and I don't yep. see the if menu you, to do that. I think it's where it says present. Oh, it's reasonable. Yeah. I think. Okay. Um, well, as I said on my way in, we don't want to rely on me for my tech skills. So, <clears throat> Prove that enough now. This slide uh, helps us understand the context of how this thousand acres began uh, is going to be returned to the nation. And it's within the context of the Superfund lawsuit that um, is winding down on, on a dark And it's important to understand that because there's a bit of a payback here. It's very small, not enough, but it's in the context of the Superfund and the damage to the lake, and particularly the damage to the nation, that the trustees that managed that case, that was the state DEC and the federal government, the office that handled that was the Fish and Wildlife Office. Those are the trustees that they decided that at least one of the projects at the end of the Superfund could benefit the Onondaga Nation. Uh, and this is an aerial photograph of uh, the area that's called Waste Beds 1 through 8, really romantic name. And now the amphitheater is built right about there. But I often start talks with this video because this is 1938. And it shows you that there's a tremendous amount of industrial waste dumped right there next to Onondaga Lake. In fact, it, that um, waste bed area and the, the uh, state fairgrounds is, is to, the, to the left there and is 80 feet deep of industrial waste. Many of you remember, if you looked across the lake towards Salve until about five years ago, you saw these white cliffs of Salve. I have a whole nother talk I could give on that. But it's this kind of damage that's the result of uh, 
It's a super fun case. And the second half is super fun, which is called the natural resource damage and assessment. The theory there is that when the polluter does not clean up all of its waste, and that's certainly the situation here, we'll get back into that a little more, then they have to pay money for damages that that pollution will cause going into the future, natural resource damages. And in that context, the trustees came up with 20 projects that Honeywell had to pay for. One of them is this thousand acres in the Tully Valley. And uh, the return of this land was decided by the state and federal governments as part of the Superfund, as I said, and it relates to the non-cleanup of the lake because 80 to 90% of the chemicals that were dumped in there remain in place. Mercury, 26 other highly toxic chemicals remain in the sediment despite the limited dredging they did. Um, it's about a two hour talk to walk through all of the, the problems that remain in there. But it's that's the context that the natural resource damage assessment uh, brings us to this point. And not only, so this white waste, and, and I think most people know that um, Salve Process is the company that began um, mining salt down in the Tully Valley, we'll certainly come back to that, and combining it with limestone from the Manlius Quarry and bringing it over to Salve, and they heated that, added ammonia, and made soda ash. Soda ash is one of the most important chemicals in the early Industrial Revolution. And for every pound of soda ash, they made a pound and a half of this white waste. And they dumped it. First, they dumped it into the lake, filling 40% of the lake. Then they began to dump it here. And this is 80 feet deep. And the other, and this waste is, it's not that toxic, but it has a pH of 13, which is way off the center. And that's what prevents trees from growing on it. Uh, but within this white, relatively harmless waste, are, they dumped everything they had at the dump, every chemical they could get rid of. And of course, nobody's watching back in the 30s, 40s, 50s. Um, and that's what's called co-deposited waste, a nice um, environmental or Orwellian term that means any chemical they can get rid of. And then the problem with the waste bed 128 is that the most dangerous of those chemicals were the benzene, toluene, the BTEX complex. These are volatile organic chemicals that vaporize up out of this waste bed today and um, are carcinogenic. And that's going on as we speak. And uh, we pushed to have them removed. And of course, that didn't happen. And when the county was designing their amphitheater, which we also said would be better built not on a toxic waste dump, <laughs> um, they knew about this vapor problem because they put a really good vapor barrier in the dressing room where the acts spend a little more time less of a, a vapor barrier in the bathroom because theoretically people spend less time there and none in the seating area. Now the seating area is open and all of that, but it, it's a very significant problem that most people don't know about. I was reminded of it about a month ago. I got a call from an elder on a dog man, 60s, who worked on that site for five years recently. He's a union laborer. He now has benzene poison, which is pretty ugly. Uh, he's lost fingers, he's losing circulation, he's losing mental capacity. And I asked him, well, didn't they have you wear protective gear? Because that was one of the conditions that came out when the amphitheater was designed. He said, no, we never had a mask or any hazmat suits or whatever. So that's a little background to the lake. Um, I could come back and uh, give a lot more talk on the lake. But to bring us um, back down to where we are now, this is a 
actually a New York State Museum map done around uh, 1900, 1906. And it shows that uh, the original territory of the Onondaga Nation is this strip here, starting in the Thousand Islands down the eastern shore of Lake Ontario. Um, and then one of the most important things, so it's about two and a half million acres that the Onondagas used to enjoy prior to colonialism. And they had just infinite fishing access uh, all along here, Henderson, Chabot Bay, this great fishing. And, and they had all these streams and, and um, a third of their diet was fish. That's been taken away from them because the land is gone, because their sacred lake is gone and the fish there are so uh, toxic that the state health department says that women and children should never eat them. And to put in perspective, this is the two and a half million acres again. This is their currently recognized territory. Oh. 7,500 acres. And the way that it happened, this is not that clear. Um, so New York took the Onondaga land from 1788 to 1822. And New York needed the land in order to settle up debts to pay uh, soldiers from the revolution. Uh, they took the land knowingly in violation of federal law and the constitution. And they immediately, this is what is called the military tract map. So from woods to this is how the state uh, began to uh, carve up the territory. But what it shows is that this is the Onondaga reservation as recognized by the 1794 Treaty of Canada. And it's that reservation that still exists theoretically, legally on paper, particularly given the Supreme Court decision two years ago in McGurdy versus Oklahoma. That is a federally recognized reservation. What does that mean on the ground? That's about a week's lecture. But um, is it much larger? Is it much larger than the 7,500 Oh my goodness, yes. Yeah. This is, um, so it's a mile around the lake, three miles to the east of the lake from where the creek used to run into it, and then 10 miles, this I believe is nine. So it's almost 10 miles square. Yes, that's thousands, tens of thousands. This is the watershed um, for Onondaga Lake. And it's the purple area that we're most interested in because that's Onondaga Creek. And the thousand acres, we'll have maps of that just shortly, uh, are down here. You see all these tributaries. Uh, and as I said, one hill over is a Tiscola. So the property is divided into two parcels. There's 750 down here. And there's another 250 over here. And the creek forms here. There are 66 tributaries that form on Dyke Creek before it gets to the river. It flows through the nation's currently recognized territory and eventually through the city of Syracuse and then past the sewage plant into the lake. Um, and it used to have great fishing. We have pictures from the 50s and 60s of people holding 20, 23 inch trout out of it. That's gone. This is the property. I don't know how well this shows in the lighting, but this is the 750 acres in the south. These are some of the tributaries here. So in that video, we saw those beautiful waterfalls. There were now, we're still exploring these thousand acres. Uh, in fact, every Thursday afternoon, folks from the forestry school and some people from the nation go out to a different area to learn more about it. Uh, what we have learned, I just finished a meeting this morning with two farming families from the Tully Valley that lease some of this land. And the more we look at this is that Honeywell just basically neglected everything except the mining. They didn't care where they farmed. 
Uh, they didn't know what was going on in any other aspect of this. They were there to get the salt to make the money. And in the process caused tremendous damage down there. And we will go over that. But we have all these tributaries. There's um, five waterfalls along here. We were looking at the lowest one of those here. It's called Fellows Falls. People in Tully, I'm lucky enough to live down there. Uh, talk about Fellows Falls, Hidden Falls. And uh, as we talk to some of the older elders down there, we learned that there used to be a lot of public access to that fall. And one of the commitments the nation has, once we get the title to the property, is to build a trail uh, that will allow access to the falls for the people in total. Um, I've been out there, but as you saw in that one slide, you have that same very, very steep uh, Finger Lakes type um, shale constructions. Um, it took us eight trips out there to find a trail that we think is um, not so steep and treacherous that people can, that we can build a safe trail. So that's one of the uh, cooperative efforts that the nation is going to give. This, um, you can see that there's some farming in there and, and that's the Southern portion. Um, this is Salve Road. For those of you that know the area, there is a very, very difficult gravel mine eating into this wall of gravel here. And what that wall of gravel is the terminal marine where the glacier pushed uh, a 500 foot wall of gravel as it was received. And to the south of that, there is a sole source aquifer that runs down to Cortland. 80,000 of us get our water out of that sole source aquifer. And there are some very, very nice Keto lakes um, that formed when the glacier receded and pieces of ice fell off and the, the valley filled in around it. But then the creek, and the creek starts here. There are trips that come off here. There's some tributaries here. Uh, I'm told that the, the, that the groups that go up Thursday just discovered a new waterfalls over on this side. So all of this is, is really, uh, and, and when the Onondaga citizens go out there, it's just so, th their joy and, and their appreciation of it is, is just beyond my limited capability to, to describe. So the creek starts here. There are brook trout in the stream that we saw at the base of the waterfall. Not a lot, but that's one of the major projects that the nation is uh, gathering partners to work on, which is a book trap restoration. Then the creek flows up, um, and I should also point out, we'll get it on another map, that there was a lot of salt mining that went on down there. We'll get into how that happened and how destructive it was. That went on much more on the sides of the valley. And we'll have a map that shows that, but that is a, was a very destructive practice that I think caused the bug boils. The northern 250 acres is up here. This is Nichols Road, Route 11A. This is kind of open and marshland. The creek goes through here. This is a really beautiful wooded hill. Uh, I walked up there about three weeks ago uh, by, uh, with a lot of people and my descent is not as graceful. Um, I'm not I'm losing my balance and probably there's some walks I shouldn't go on. Between here and here, you can't find a Tisco road on this paper, but the mud boils pop up here. And we will go over what those are, what caused them and, and the damage that they caused to the nation. So this is that same valley. Um, and again, the creek running in here, mining going on over here. Doesn't show it as well as I thought it did. And the creek coming up here, this is the mud boils. And so that by the, the creek here, it's clean, pristine. You saw some of the shots of it. I remember in the 80s, Chief Irving Crowles Jr. took me out there to show me the creek at that point, because after the mud boils, Downstream of the mud boils, the creek is filled with silt and salt. 20 tons of silt and salt are dumped into that creek 
every day. So you have a clean creek down here, muddy, useless creek from there on. That's some of what we're trying to, what the trustees were trying to address to compensate in this one of 20 uh, projects in the natural resource damages. Yeah. So, um, Not exactly sure where this is taken in the valley, but it, it's just more of a background side for me to talk more about. Uh, first of all, this is a thousand acres. It's historic. We have not found another example anywhere on Turtle Island, and that's how the indigenous people re refer to the United States, where that much land has been returned to an indigenous nation where they have control. Most governments, and we'll get back to why the state thought that's how it was going to happen this time. Usually, if land comes back, it comes back with all sorts of conditions, or it has to go into trust, so that the federal government makes those decisions. But in this situation, the agreement is that it will return to the Onondaga Nation for restoration, and any public access has to be compatible with that restoration and those restorations. And it comes out of a very elaborate consent decree that was uh, agreed to by Honeywell and the trustees. But the nation will make decisions about how it will be restored and whether or not, well, for instance, the consent decree said there's, there's to be public access along all 11 miles of the stream. These documents were drawn up by people that never set foot on the property and didn't have a clue that we can't even get to half of that. And because we're going to do brook trout restoration, we don't need a lot of heavy traffic along those streams, at least until we have a, a fishing, uh, at least until that population is brought back where it's healthy enough. So this is a really historic accomplishment for the nation. And in a minute, I'll quote some of the, the officials that recognize that. And in these days of truth and reconciliation and reparations, it's important to understand that if we're going to begin to address some of the historic homes to indigenous people, there's only one thing that really works for that, and that's land. Land is what defines the culture and integrity of any indigenous community, and we just have to find land, find ways to do more land return. And we're hopeful that this project will be uh, an example that we can um, <clears throat> we can grow on. So as I said, there's a consent decree. Oh dear. Oh. I don't want to get there. <laughs> there's a consent decree. It called for the, the creation of this thousand acres. It was either going to go to the state of New York or to a third party. Um, and this June, the trustees finally decided, agreed with us, that it could be given back to the nation um, <clears throat> with the, the jurisdictional control that I just talked about. That was not an easy accomplishment, and we'll come back to that in a minute, too. Um, so on, on, in June, there was an announcement of an agreement between the trustees the day informed Honeywell that this property will be returned to Onondaga Nation. In that um, trustee agreement, one of the paragraphs read, the Tully property is co-located within the ancestral, ancestrally stewarded territory of the Onondaga Nation, whose original instructions to maintain their indigenous lifestyles would be furthered by resuming their land tenure over the Tully property for generations to come, such that it will heal the land of the people. These, these are two outside governments really quoting from Onondaga documents and, and philosophy. It was endorsed by the highest levels of government. Um, Interior Secretary Deb Haley 
and, and then after their agreement, the trustees worked out a press release. About three weeks into that process, I kept, I started asking, how many bureaucrats does it take to write a press release? And I still don't know the answer to that question. But so we had, um, we started out with very low level um, agency folks that we were talking to. So this land was, was, the nation knew that there was some possibility they could get it back, but in the consent decree, there were conditions that were difficult. Whoever took it had to accept it as is. And because it's in such a heavily mined and damaged territory with tremendous damage on both sides of it, that is something that caused a great deal of pause. The, the new owner would have to agree never to sue Honeywell for damage that they'd done to that property. I made clear that we reserved the right to sue them for other things, and that there would be a consent, uh, a conservation ease, which at first sounded totally helpful and innocuous. A conservation easement is to preserve. Unfortunately, the DEC, in our opinion, of that has uh, has been. <laughs> A lot of work. But Secretary Hanlon said, this historic agreement represents a unique opportunity to return traditional homelands back to indigenous people to steward for the benefit of their community. So we have the Secretary of Interior making a very, very positive comment this summer. The governor took a very, very positive statement also, and eventually called the Iron Dog and I helped to arrange a call where there were eight on guarded leaders on the phone, uh, on a Zoom with the Secretary, uh, with, with Governor Hope. And particularly given the fact that the last governor never even met with us, uh, that was received very well. So it's very high level governmental uh, decisions is what I'm really trying to stress. It wasn't that way when it started because First, it took the nation two years to decide that those three conditions were acceptable, that we could see if we could work with them. Um, I forget that nobody can hear my uh, phone ring except me, it rings into my ear. <laughs> so, so we start out and we sit down finally after many meetings in the Long House, the council authorized me to tell the trustees that we would talk to them about getting the land back. And at first, it was almost hostile from the local DEC and the Cortland Office of Fish and Wildlife. It will only come back if you agree to let us make the decision going forward. Full public action. Uh, and we worked for a year under those conditions. And finally, I just said this, either we can't get the land or something else has to happen. And so I went over their heads. Uh, something I've learned to do in my 47 years of practice. It didn't exactly uh, make us friends locally, but we got to the highest level of the Interior Department's lawyers there. Their lawyers are called solicitors. And through a series of letters, calls, emails, I got to the lawyer that's in charge of the natural resource damages in interior. And he knew right away what, how this should happen. And that really helped change. It. And we also got to the commissioner of the Department of Environmental Conservation, that's Basil Sagos. And, and he and I had some very, very positive exchanges in the spring over some treaty fishing rights. And, and in April, he decided that he would instruct people working under him to work to return this land in the proper way. And it almost didn't happen, but one of the things that tipped the scales is that in February of this year, Robin Kimmerer's office was asked to write a paper that would explain to these uh, non-Indigenous bureaucrats the strengths and benefits of returning land to indigenous stewardship for everybody, that everybody would benefit from that. And I 
think we all know that Robin just was awarded a genius, uh, a MacArthur Genius Grant because of her work advancing traditional ecological knowledge, which is a term that uh, I don't know if she coined it, but it's it's how they refer to indigenous people's relationship with the natural world. And it's just what we talked about before. Nature healing not only the people, but the land. And so Robin's paper really tipped the balance there. Uh, and her office works with us almost daily on this. There are two younger uh, biologists that work in the, in the, she runs the Center for Environmental Studies and Indigenous People. Uh, two biologists from there go out there with us once a week and continue the biological evaluation of it. So, as I said before, this is a small first step. step in reparations for the centuries of colonial attempts to obliterate the Onondaga people and for the destructive impacts of the industrial wasting of their lands and water. This is really important in the context of losing their sacred lake, losing their fishing on their creek. And um, I'll explain now how that happens. Mud boat. This is a mud boat. This is just south of the Tisco Road. So, solid process engaged in pulling brine out of the Tully Valley. They used a, a mining method called solution mining, where they just pump water down into the salt vein, which is about 1,200 feet below the surface. There's a salt vein under all of New York State. Um, and of course, it's, it's very important for them winter roads, uh, but for salvi, it was the key, one of the key ingredients into their whole chemical process. And so they used water from those kettle lakes, which are 500 feet higher, and pumped it down into wells that they drilled into the brine area, and then dissolved the salt, and then they pulled the brine up and shipped it over to salvi. Problem with that is that when you solution salt mine, as opposed to how it's done these days, which is room and pillar, where they actually go down that 1,200 feet uh, with huge shafts and machinery and mine it much like coal, they need pillars. And the pillars have some structure. Here, there's no structure. There is a, the hole in the size, in the bottom of this valley, the size of 35 carrier domes. We're talking about. Because it's a glacial valley, it's many, many layers. You put a hole in the bottom of it, and it's falling in constantly. Although we think it's slowing down, and that's another color. But this is the result of that falling in. So this is about four miles downstream between the mining and the nation. And so now, This constantly is bringing up silt and salt. And you can see it running. Put a stick in here, there's no bottom. This is driven by overpressurization of the other. And I'll come back to that. This is uh, that mud boil is over here. This is where it flows into Onondaga Creek. You can see that the creek is relatively clean up here not afterwards. And so what has happened up here, this is a sinkhole. It's 600 feet across, 50 feet deep. It sits directly above one of the areas of mining. This is on the east side. There are three major sinkholes on both sides of the valley with this thousand acres between them. And this actually has been a don't like this word, remediate. You can see this green line around it. That's where it used to be before they began to pull a little bit of the water off and bring it down to the creek. But that shows you the amount of subsidence that's going on 
because of that huge hole in the bottom of the valley that I talked about. So because the valley's falling in, the sides of the valley are cracking. This is one of hundreds, and I don't know how many hundreds, of rock fissures. So you have a dry finger lake with very steep hills. Those hills are cracking. Hundreds and hundreds. This gentleman is actually a Honeywell vice president. But I'm, I didn't push him in. But seriously, <laughs> these are incredibly dangerous. That's a very narrow one that uh, the guy out there is right now. Um, you can't see the bottom of these. Many of them are three and four feet across. And so now Honeywell has put up 10 foot chain link fences around these areas so that they can walk away from them. Uh -huh. But those cracks, those fissures are the cause of the mud balls. So the water that used to run off the top uh, on the surface and go into the creek and continue on its way now goes on underground. It's down into the salt vein, comes back up, carrying silt and salt, overpressurizing the aquifer that drives those mud boils downstream. I go to all that lake because by the time it gets to the nation, there's no fish. And so the son of Irving Paulus, who showed me that um, the clean fishing, you know, you. you Irving is no longer with us, but Warren Lyons it's, it's 90s remembers fishing in that stream on the nation at night with a kerosene lantern and a spearing truck. You don't have a clean stream when you can do that. And they used to go down there every day uh, between the mud boils and the so called flood control dam. That creek has essentially been stolen from the nation. They can't fish. And that's what makes the fishing um, potential of this property so important. This um, shows you that geographically. So that's the big, each white dot is former salt mine. That's the big sink, and there are other sinks. Each of these yellow dots is a rock fissure. So you have the mining down here and the hills cracking here. Wow. Honeywell doesn't want us to know this. And there's a much longer talk that could be given out by us. And on the other side, it's even worse. So this is the east side, the thousand the 750 acres are between it. And the same thing is going on on the west. And that was 2006. That was 2006. So there's probably more yellow dots. It's relatively stable. Um, my main concern is how stable are the areas between them? You know, the 750 that were taken. And we have looked at subsidence records from there. And uh, because there are 57 abandoned wells in this property. So you can see that this is not exactly a pure, uh, it has a lot of complications. I'll just yeah. it. This is your core, your core, the manliest core. Mm -hmm. Manliest core is the largest open pit quarry in the state. This, and so one for one, the salt is matched with the limestone. And this gives you an idea of the magnitude of what they took out of both spots. I just threw that in this morning. Just one more look at the mud boils. So this is the creek downstream of the mud boils. Uh, it may not look at here, but this is clean. That's the mud boils. You see the creek coming in yeah. here, going through the mud boils. And that's the creek afterwards. So this is what one of the harms that we're trying to uh, trying to address with this property. 
So this is historic. It's the largest in the country. It has tremendous potential for the Onondaga people, particularly to regain the ability to get good, clean uh, trout that they can eat. Uh, and lots of other natural beauty and uh, potential on this thing. There's some, some amazing trees, given that we know the area was heavily logged in the past. And as I said, there are two parcels, 750 down here, the 250 up there. Now, for instance, the people that drew the consent decree insisted that fishing be allowed on the northern portion. Well, there isn't any fishing on the northern portion because the mud boils have already gone. Yeah. That shows you that they had no, there's people sitting in Washington and Albany that have never set foot on this property. And so we're left with a bunch of conditions that are either inappropriate or just just make no sense at all. But that's um, that's what's taking so long to. We're now in negotiations with the two trustees, with Honeywell, trying to get documents, uh, trying to get history. It's a bit of work. <clears throat> so. The brook trout still live down there, but they're challenged. But we have um, we're putting together a, a coalition of people to restore them. And that will help restore the laws of fishing. As I said before, there are many waterfalls. It's either six or seven, we're still cranking. Um, we just went out into the northern portion a couple of weeks ago. There's some very, very pristine sections there. And as you saw from the beginning, from the video at the beginning, this land has a great deal of potential. Uh, <clears throat> there are, uh, I remember one spot that's right at the edge and where a, a new beaver pond has been built that flooded an area. That uh, killed off several large trees, and at the top of it, these three of those trees are heron nests. Mm -hmm. So um, that's the kind of potential that's in this property. So you may wonder, well, why would they take this land that's been abused, that's surrounded by bad, uh, very, very destroyed property that you, you can't even go on, they put chain on fences on, and there may still be subsiding, because a thousand acres is a 20% increase in their recognized territory. May not sound like a lot, given the two and a half million acres they used to have. I can tell you the joy when the people go out there and find a plant that they hadn't seen yeah. before, because their, their knowledge of biology and botany is so superior to certainly mine in terms of this plant works for this, and oh, my aunt used to use this plant. It's really, uh, of course, it's always better to be out in the field than at your desk, but it's just wonderful to be out with the Onondagas on this map. There's much forest, some wetlands. As I said, there is some farming, much less than there used to be. So we knew that there were farming leases there, and we know the two families along 11A, they run the farms, they stand within their hands. And um, I just finished meeting with them this morning because some of the some of this is still leased to them. We're obviously going to continue to support those family farms and, and allow them to farm where they need to. Um, and eventually those farms will probably fall as, as 90 some percent of the family farms already have. But it's just it has all this potential. It has wetlands, forests, waterfalls, plants that are much more abundant than I can possibly describe. And the joy of the Onondaga people when they go out there is beyond my capability to describe. So that's a brief overview of how this resulted, some of the challenges, and all the potential. And it's very, very consistent with the nation's commitment to work cooperatively with its neighbors. 
if 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 you were here in 2005 when they filed their land rights action, it was not a land claim to take the land back. It was a request to be heard on environmental decisions in that two and a half million acres. Our federal courts did a horrible job of that and another embarrassingly wrong set of decisions. But they caught when when they when we filed the case, they instructed us to put the first paragraph in there that their efforts to gain their land were always focused on healing. Healing the land, healing the people so that they have more land that they can interact with, and healing the relationship with their non-Indigenous neighbors. And I can tell you from doing work over at Cayuga that the relationship between non-Indigenous people here in Onondaga Territory is so much more positive and both sides benefiting than what's going on over at Cayuga and to some extent over at Oneida. Partially because the Onondagas learned that when you in the United Land claim about 20 some years ago, some out of state lawyers were frustrated with the negotiations and they said, well, we know how to get more legal leverage here. And so they amended their land claim to add all 20,000 land owners, threatening to take away people's homes and farms. It was done by an out-of-state lawyer who had no clue that that may have had some legal advantage, actually it worked against them, but the political fallout from that was just remarkable. And any person who, you know, if somebody tells you you're going to take your house to your farm, we all know what our reaction is. So for the Onondagas to do things positively and to send out speakers and to send me out and try to talk with their neighbors about what's going on, how we can check the land together. I'm just, uh, I try to appreciate how fortunate I am to be able to be involved in that. So that's my prepared remarks and if I'm sure we'll have some questions and um, I'll see if I can answer them. Yes. I'm going to talk loudly. <laughs> Good. Um, uh, and I think I heard you say that this is a first step. Does this, but does this agreement mean from the perspective of Honeywell, the state, uh, and the Department of Interior that this is done? That you can't come back, that the Onondagas can't come back for additional land? Um, there is no agreement that we, if we take this, we can't ever ask for another acre. In the context of this super fund, <clears throat> there probably isn't more land that could come to us that would be acceptable. Actually, we don't know that, okay? <laughs> because we find the border. We were not consulted. They haven't been explained to us. And in fact, there's an area here that Honeywell and DEC think that they've made some informal arrangement to take 80 acres out of and to add them over here. And they just did that in February when we were actually sitting down and talking to them. At the same time, they have a consultation policy that would have required them to tell us that. So we don't even know where the borders are, and we don't know whether or not there's more land that could be available here. If there is, and, and the other thing that the Onondagas have been very careful about, they do accept property that's given to them, and they have purchased some parcels over the last 20 years, but they do that next to their currently recognized territories and their they, I've seen what these patchwork reservations result in. They, 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 they just don't know. And they know that. So um, if, if more land could be acquired in the valley, that's certainly something that 
is possible and that the nation would be interested in. Um, our relationship with Honeywell is not that good. And, but we hope there's the possibility of more land here. Um, and the one piece of land that is becoming quite disappointing is that uh, the nation deserves to have a, a, a piece of land on Onondaga Lake. 2011, the county passed a, a legislative res resolution to uh, return uh, land on the lake. That was Murphy's Island, which is between uh, Manifest Destiny Mall and the lake. And um, actually, it looks great. It's got great cottonwood. Um, and so the, 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 a lot of that effort came from non-Dargas non working with politicians. It just looked like a good spot. It's where the Eagles now roost. And of course, the county's driving a trail through the Eagles. So, you know, just, I'll leave that. But Murphy's Island is incredibly uh, uh, polluted. There are eight different corporations. With so the cottonwoods have grown up on this horribly polluted base. And it just could never be clean enough. So we have been around the lake. We have identified another area. It's called Maple Bay. Um, it's way down on what they call the northern end of the lake. If you have Willow Bay over here, the county park, Maple Bay is on the other side of the river. 2016, Joni Mahoney tried to get the legislature to break that promise. They didn't. They pushed back, renewed the commitment, and um, left it to be uh, an area to be identified. A few years ago, we were out on Maple Bay with Ron Mann, and he made a promise to Tarragaho and other Onondaga leaders that that would be returned. I have the political capital, it was right after he took over. He doesn't seem to want to do that. We can't even get a meeting. We're hopeful that this will encourage other people to think in a like way and to understand the, uh, why that promise should be kept. And the one thing that is important to indigenous people is some access to clean water. If you don't have clean water, it's very difficult to have a, um, an indigenous community that's, uh, that's able to thrive. You know, the reason their current territory is on Onondaga Creek is that it used to support them. So, um, no, there's no agreement that we can't get any more land. They would never agree to that. Um, but in this context, this is probably the best we can come out of the Superfund. Although there is one more step of Superfund. There is a future benefits project fund. Uh, where there's $5 million set aside for other projects that haven't been identified yet by the trustees. Uh, actually, we hope to use some of that money to build the Phillips Falls trail because there's no money for that. And Honeywell just said, well, we're not paying for that. Not in the, we didn't agree to that. Um, I just, if there's one thing Honeywell is really good at, it's saying no and not living up to the responsibility of the tremendous damage they caused. And then and also hiding the damage they caused. Because this courses should be taught in colleges about the construction that happened from that solution. So we have expert opinions that indicate that they should have stopped the mining in the 20s. That by, so there was a certain point, as I said before, they took water from the Kettle Lakes and pumped it down there. That's the solution salt mining. At a certain point in time, I think it's in the 20s, at the same time that they were losing wells because of shifting underground that should have told them something, they didn't have to put water down there anymore, which meant that they'd made enough damage with the however many wells, scores and scores of them, that the water was getting down into the salt pain because of what they'd already done. And that unleashed, uh, they don't know where they mined down there. 
all the dirt it was the brine come out of the hole of course so and so they didn't have to use the water from the lakes they owned the entire area around crooked lake which is now uh, residential but the houses went up there in the 70s or 80s so this is a, another example of why environmental laws are good let's hope the clean water act last a few more months because uh, this is an example this and the lake are examples of why we have to control uh, why we need environmental laws and why we need to work together so yes. no we there there this is there, there won't be any more land in this package but there is no agreement to, that Certainly, the Onondagas talk about getting more land back as as it becomes, but they won't ever inconvenience a neighbor to do that. Back in the eighties, uh, when the United Land Claim had survived the first round of dismissals, and Neil McCurran was handling it, he's a, a very well. I don't know that Neil's still with us, but he was a very nice, thought, thoughtful federal judge. I don't say that about all federal judges. And he came up with a plan to settle the Oneida land claim. And he said, well, why don't we sit down and decide on an area into which the Oneida nation will expand? At that time, when, when I first started, when I first went to Oneida, they had a 32-acre trailer farm in the middle of the United Arena. Uh, he said, let's sit down, agree upon an area into which the nation will expand, and then make agreements that the nation has the right of first refusal for every property transfer in that area. It benefits the seller, because they know they have a seller, doesn't, doesn't threaten them, and eventually, through a reverse checkerboard, you can create a territory that has not harmed you. If you start taking back land willy-nilly um, or suing people in federal court to take their land back, that, that doesn't work. So there are ways of doing this that can be done very well if, if people work together respectfully. Right? And that's certainly the instructions that I've had since the early 80s working with the Onondagas. Well, that's a long-winded answer. Right? I love that. <laughs> I don't, do you think you want to ask any questions? What? Did you want to ask any questions? Yeah, I, so the, Mr. Corkman, so the land is still owned by Honeywell around the area? Yes. Okay. Why do they even want it? That's the question I have. <laughs> Why do they still want it yet? Oh, they can't get rid of it. They can't get rid of the damage areas. Oh, no, but I mean, I'm wondering why they're hanging on to it. And they just don't give it all away. You know what I mean? Well, because you can't, it, it is so incredibly damaged that it can't be given away. Okay, so the nation wouldn't even take the damage away. They're trying to take as little as possible. Well, <laughs> well that's a, I, I, mean, I have it's learned kind of interesting, you know? that I don't do well at predicting nation decisions. That's true. <laughs> yeah, you're right. No one can predict really decisions, but, really. But, yeah. I, it wouldn't it wouldn't be useful for the nation it's oh. so dangerous okay oh. and you know the only thing it would be useful for is a scientific study now there, there there is ongoing work to do something about the mud boy yeah there's been amazing strides with things like phyto re, uh, remediation and uh, uh reclaiming of mining areas you know <laughs> So it's almost like somebody's PhD project ongoing. Well, New York doesn't have a very good history of reclaiming mining areas. No, they don't, but yeah. I mean, there's uh, manliest. Right. And gravel mines don't get reclaimed. But, no, but this, no, but no, that no. surface is, I certainly don't want to minimize the, the damage that surface mines cause, but this is so much yeah, more this, right. Now, we are trying to, working with combination of people it might be as many as 20 parties have bi-weekly calls studying the mud boils and mm -hmm. whether or not there is a solution upstream yes 
or which is our preference, or something downstream that can be done to get that silt and salt out of the creek. Right, like a giant wet lift or something for filtration. A settlement you know, so, I mean, that, you know, something like that. Actually, there's one fellow that thinks you can move the creek. Oh, that's another thought. Can you move the creek? Uh, right? <laughs> but if we could cure the mud boils, it would be great for everybody. In, for instance, in the city of Syracuse, about 10 years ago, FEMA told, I forget how many hundred families on the south side that they had to get flood insurance. The reason for that was that the creek carrying capacity had been reduced by the three to four feet of sediment in the creek. Well, why not make Honeywell throw the creek? But luckily, and those are families that can't afford an extra thousand dollars a year. Luckily, a Pam Hunter, our assembly woman, got the state to pay for that. But that's consequences of not of the mud uh, And there's more to that story. Just <laughs> so, what exactly um, is a mud boil? But we have a scientist who has studied them, the same one that um, talked about before, about the 20s and stuff. So the problem is too much pressure in water getting down into the aquifer that causes the fissures. So um, Russell thinks that we could identify 10 to 12 fissures that carry the most water mm -hmm. and fill them. Concrete, I don't know. That would reduce some of the flow and that you could put pressurizing wells down in here that would be able to take that water that's relatively clean off the aquifer and reduce the pressure enough to stop the mud. Mm. That's the theory. It makes some sense. Can you tell me exactly what is a mud boil? That's the mud boil. Because upstream of this, there's too much water getting into the aquifer. It comes up here because of that excess pressure. That carries all that mud, 20 tons of silt and salt a day, into the creek. Okay. No, you. there are no other mud boils anywhere. Yeah. I know. Okay. In the world? At least in the United States. Oh my goodness. Really? And yet, Oh, how many years ago? Maybe five years ago, I was out at uh, Welsh Allen giving a talk to engineers, and I gave the same talk, and I said the mud boils were caused by Honeywell Solution Salt Mining, knowing that their engineer was in the audience because he had come up and glad-handed me beforehand. He came up to me after a smoke was coming out of his ears. Just said, how can you say that we caused the mud boils? Um, denial. So this is, it, it, they don't want people to know about it and they want to walk away from it. And they certainly deny responsibility for it. We have tried to find law firms, the attorney general's office, who would join us in suing Honeywell. Honeywell, by the way, is really Allied Chemical. Allied bought Honeywell in the late nineties and kept the nice user-friendly name that we all associate with our thermostats. Uh, but they're responsible between them for 140 Superfund sites around the country, more than any other corporation. So they know how to do this, how to avoid responsibility. They are much better at that than the agency lawyers that are pitted against. Them. And sooner or later, it comes down, well, we can either take our offer or litigate. They saved at least $40 billion not cleaning up the lake. They use that for some engineers, lawyers, and um, we can't sue them until we get the scientific proof. Now, you've heard me explain how it happens. It's a fourth grader would come to the same conclusion, I think, but they're never, but it's a very complex glacial valley with many layers and the hydrogeologists have 
yet to be able to study it enough to make that direct conclusion. The, the uh, USGS, what is that? The, the United States Geological Survey uh, is doing further testing down there. It's just so complex that until we get clear scientific proof that this is linked to what they did down there, we can't go after them because they could afford to fix it. Um, so that's a motor oil. And, oh, I, I have another video on that. I, I went out there, but they, I got it publicized in the Syracuse paper back when they used to have reporters. And um, they put a video up and I got in a lot of trouble because I hadn't asked permission. So now I have to get written permission from the Honeywell lawyers to go on there. But it was well worth it. But still, but how many people in our community know that the creek that runs through our city has been ruined by what they did out there? Not enough. Yeah. Is the 2011 county legislative resolution still in effect? Did they ever rescind it? It was actually supplemented, but not rescinded in 2016. So the resolution now is we reaffirm our commitment to return land to the nation. But this is clever. Don't get me going on the county legislature. Oh, please do. <laughs> How it's 17 to 6, it says something about gerrymandering in my opinion, but um, it's a non binding resolution, which means they can ignore it. That's what it means. Oh, this feels good. We're going to save these. We're going to return the other day. Oh, but you can't force us. Was now, there? Um, oh, sorry. Again, there are, well, we don't know how the county legislature is going to change or whether or not it, it, they have shown some independence that I hadn't seen in a long time. Um, well, they wouldn't look fund his ridiculous aquarium until he had a sausage uh, agreement to buy a vote. But we don't have an independent uh, three parts of county government. No. And, and, and that's tragic. I mean. And, mm -hmm. you know, to spend $85 million on something that's not going to work when we have the highest child poverty in the nation, uh, I don't like that. Me and, either. You know, we could do better. So is there anything written that Ryan McMahon ever gave you any documentation that he was going to work to return the land to the Onondagas even when he was just a Oh, yeah, this direct promise. I mean, and, and it was kind of emotional because for them to be able, this is a sacred, like, this is where the Confederacy was born. You know, the, the, their oral history is that this is where the, the peacemaker brought the five warring nations together and buried their weapons of war. It's recognized by Congress that the great law of peace and, and their um, confederacy is recognized as the basis for the Constitution. And yet they don't have land on their own life. And um, <clears throat> so the Aquarium was just another level of insult. Um, and it's really too bad. Hopefully they won't build their beach because nobody will go to it. But. Oh, people in the city who can't get out to the lakes will. Well, that's the other aspect of this. When you think about the environmental justice of having a lake, a freshwater lake, that actually borders on a city that can't be used. When the decision makers live out in Skinny Atlas, Casnovia, um, there's some environmental justice issues there. So yes, what would the quality of life be for people that live in the city if that were a clean lake? And we haven't even talked about the people being poisoned every day by the fish that get out there because the county won't put up a proper sign to warn them. And so we know that there are refugees that eat fish 40 times a month. They eat the entire fish. So the Department of Health says, Women and children should never eat fish from Onondaga Lake. 
And actually, we just found out about a new chemical that the poison could be in there. PFAS is these forever chemicals. And so the, county, the Board of Health, or the Department of Health says, well, men can eat once a month if you fillet a certain sec section of the food. Well, if you're from Burma, you go out to that lake, it's clean, doesn't smell anymore, most days. It's free food. You go out there today, you will find people with five gallon bucket putting the fish in. I just had a student from forestry school interview me yesterday. He had heard me talk at a class a few weeks before. He was out there Saturday and he interviewed a woman fishing and he said, doesn't that sign mean anything to you? And actually, I forget which sign because the city has the proper signs that everybody agreed to and the county has what we call the happy fish sign that say these fish may be harmful to your health when the Department of Health says don't eat them. Uh, and she said, she told them, oh, oh yeah, that means if I eat on Monday, I can't eat Tuesday, I have to wait till Monday. But again, given the level of poverty that we have, we have a refugee city where 60 languages are taught in one of our high schools, not taught, but spoken in one of our high schools. People are out there every day eating fish that should never be eaten. But that's not acceptable. But what if there were good fish in there? You know, when you read, people didn't really, people, settlers didn't really start coming to Onondaga with any frequency until the mid 1700s. And then there were expeditions that came up from Pennsylvania. And you read some of those Moravian journals and, uh, Every settler who first saw that lake marveled at the quality and quantity of fish in that lake. The fish used to be a delicacy, and you know, the white fish used to be a delicacy in New York City restaurant. There was a water based resort industry on there prior to the salvage process. What would our life be like, and particularly like for people in the city, if they could go down there and use that lake? And yes, have a real beach. Yeah, that's the tragedy of all of this. That everybody loses. So, Anadarya will keep pushing. Joe, may I, <clears throat> excuse me, may I just ask a quick question about uh, uh, nation land ownership? Uh, the land that uh, is, being, is being or has been acquired uh, that you discuss in your talk uh, <clears throat> goes to the nation itself, uh, correct? Uh, what I'm wondering about, are you still there? Mm, yeah. <laughs> what I'm wondering about is the uh, concept of, of uh, land ownership uh, on the uh, nation itself. Uh, how do individual uh, Native Americans, Onondaga uh, Nation uh, members have any actual ownership rights? Do people that have uh, homes uh, rent the land upon which those uh, homes are, are constructed from the nation? Uh, how does that work? Well, that's an excellent question. Um, there is no individual ownership of land on the Onondaga Nation. And there certainly never was prior to the colonialism. And um, so at the same time, houses stay within families for generations. If they're, so people use the land and it's somewhat controlled by the nation when there's a need for intervention. If there is a death in a family, clan gets together first and, and the clan mother says, well, this relative is the person who will get the use of the house. And usually that works relatively easily. If there's a dispute and they can't work it out in the clan, it comes into the longhouse and a, a decision is made. You can imagine that some of those get a little edgy, but um, that's how, uh, but the ownership, the ultimate ownership is always with the nation. I, 
lucky enough over the last year and a half to be, uh, I teach one afternoon a, a, a week down at Cornell Law School. And we're studying now the concept that the breakup of communal land through the allotment process in the 1880s was one of the most direct attacks on indigenous culture that we engaged in as part of our assimilation process. So to those of us who are not used to that, oh, I don't own my land, how can that work? That was a defining characteristic of indigenous cultures and their nations. And the federal government knew that well enough to attack that and to break up uh, communally owned lands, assign a certain size of it to each Indian, and then say, oh, well, the rest is surplus and we can sell that to non Indians. So the communal ownership of land is central to particularly traditional indigenous culture. I'm trying to think if there are places where that is not the case and I probably should let that thought go. Thank you. So there is no ability on the part of individuals who, for example, want to construct a home uh, to obtain a conventional uh, type of mortgage loan because they don't have they don't have ownership. They don't have the ability to pledge the property as collateral security for the loan, and that may also carry over to uh, projects of uh, major projects of the nation itself. Uh, such as the uh, wonderful lacrosse ice hockey facility. Maybe that was all self-financed and other improvements, other uh, improvements that are uh, paid for and constructed by the, by the nature, nation itself. They probably don't have the ability to go out and get a commercial loan because they're not going to be able to or, or choosing not to pledge land as collateral security for those loans. Um, you make two good points. I, I'm, I'm thinking kind of uh, apropos, you know, nobody likes to talk about the Oneidas and all the crazy things they're doing down down there, but, but I think they may be sort of self-financing uh, out of cash flow from their existing properties uh, new properties as opposed to having the ability to go to a, uh, you know, a, a, a mortgage lender uh, because no matter how, even though they have a completely different uh, model uh, than, than the Onondaga Nation as far as tradition and whatever, they still have the same reality that uh, the nation is the sort of communal owner of the, of the, of the lands uh, themselves. Well, there's more than one question here, but they're all good. No, people don't get mortgages on Onondaga, and they can't, because you're right, they don't have the property for the bank to uh, take back. The nation builds houses for people. The nation repairs houses for people. And people um, prefer that. So, um, <clears throat> That's how mortgages are not applicable on the nation. When it comes to building the arena, the fire barn, the new pavilion that was put up for the international games a few years ago, you're right, that gets true. Um, and they don't, so the problem is you have a, let's say, somewhat arbitrary figures. Let's say that arena is going to cost you $5 million and, and you want to uh, finance it. You can't finance it. You're right. The nation has never taken out a loan that I'm aware of. So what we did, because obviously uh, a contractor wants to get paid when they finish their work. So we drew up uh, an escrow agreement. Contractor says, this is going to cost $5 million. Uh, that uh, We're going to set up an agreement where the nation's lawyer will sign with the contracting company 
to pay every month a certain amount that's predicted and agreed upon each month. That money goes into my escrow in advance. When the engineers and architects uh, tell the nation that that work has been done properly, it comes out of my escrow account, which they can enforce against. It's not something I wanted. The first time they put a million dollars in my account, I said to Sid, oh, you're trying to get rid of me, huh? Uh, but that's how we have worked around that because they will not waive sovereign immunity no matter what. Juxtaposed to that is that I'm not sure how uh, Mr. Hallgreter is financing whatever he's got going over there now. The first time he built that casino, he waived sovereign immunity so that he could get a loan. And uh, that would just never happen in our economy. So um, just Sovereignty, first of all, it's under constant attack. There's, there's just been an effort to not have separate nations for so long, but it, it raises tons of complications. But for them, it's, it's, it's very much worth it. And that's, at least they have a great deal of control over what goes on on their own property. So what exactly is going to happen with this land? Are there going to be new homes built on it or is it just going to be strictly a preservation or? There's, um, I think there's a, a provision in the consent decree not to build homes. There's certainly no um, plans to do that. Um, as I said, they, they have acquired some other property I just closed on 200 acres um, last week. That would, there, it's funny. You pay for it, they can't tell you what to do with it. So they, uh, they need more land. Their population is growing. Um, they're entitled to more land. But on this, they, there will be no homes. Uh, so the, the main thing is, we have to finish the biological assessment of what's there and what's not there. Listen to folks at the Forest School as to what they say would be a good uh, restoration project. And that's the concentration for now. They also are talking about having um, at least places where they can have people come in for educational talks. Uh, they're going to help, we hope, help build access to Fellows Falls, perhaps other areas, although. There's a lot of other areas that non onondagas can uh, access very near this land and elsewhere. Uh, this ought to be their land to use as they want, and that's where their folks are. But no homes. Um, generally, restore the land, uh, reforest as much of it as possible. Once, uh, you know, they would certainly prefer not to have cornfields in the middle of it other than their three sisters. Uh, but the main thing is, first of all, we haven't closed yet. The title do doesn't transfer until perhaps March, although I don't think that's realistic under the, what we're not getting from Honeywell and the trustees. But no homes, but total restoration. That's really number one. I do have another question. So when you said before that this sort of patchwork reservation doesn't work, what kind of problems arise? Well, how do you protect this? Um, this is at least large chunks, okay? I mean, it's not an Indian. So we had the opportunity. So Salve Road runs east and west. Why is it called Salve? Um, between the gravel mine and this area. We had the opportunity, or a neighbor called me and said, there's a house on Salvay Road for sale. Um, and the nation, uh, well, decided that that would not be a good idea because it's so separate that they wouldn't be able to, um, that's probably not the best example, but they are very careful 
not to give property that's isolated that they don't think they can protect. Uh, we have some, uh, there's one other waterfall that was given to them that um, is pretty isolated, but it, the real problem comes in for governance. How does the sheriff know where he is? Uh, what Department of Transportation laws apply here and here and here? So that's when it gets complicated. Okay. Uh, the jurisdictional issues as much as, and um, <clears throat> for them, it's much more getting 200 acres on the southern border of their currently recognized territory. That's useful. They can, first of all, there's a beaver pond that's on both sides of that border. They can immediately start thinking about families moving in there and still being associated with their central government and, and cultural affairs, their ceremonies, uh, be able to take advantage of the nation's school. So it just makes much more sense to keep everything as tightly knit as we can. That's the best I understand. You had a, a slide of the Kinsella Quarry. Um, and I don't know if you know this, but the town of Manlius is going through a comprehensive planning process for the first time ever. And the Kinsellas want to build multiple quarries to the east of that existing quarry. I thought that Three Falls Woods was up there. From what I understand, it's uh, down from Palmer Road. Okay, I, I, I know we worked on Three Falls Woods a few years ago and that's been protected. This is relatively recent. Okay. So, and it's a, an issue. And in the comprehensive planning process, citizens had a study group and four different sessions. And I listened to two of them. One was by Doug Zamelis, um, another attorney who focuses on uh, uh, zoning issues. And uh, it was very scary to hear what a town gives up when it gives uh, zoning that will allow for the quarry to be built. Um, and it's another situation where you have homeowners who do not have deep pockets versus a quarry company that does and also can poss possibly outlist the lifetimes of the people who might object to it. Um, do you have any thoughts about... If you could send me some information on that, I would appreciate it. I will definitely send you information. And there's also some interest from the people who have been, who organized those study groups, because there is a, a body of water that was known to be a, a, a creek, brook, spring, I, I'm forgetting the name of it, that starts up on Palmer Road on the hill and comes down into that valley area, which is like Route 5. I so anyway. Know, I don't know the area well enough, but... Uh... But we'll, we'll be in touch. Okay. So what uh, what she was just talking about is yeah, the me... existing Kinsella Quarry very out. near the very near the changing seasons track. The point I'm trying to make here is that we really could recycle a great deal of aggregate that we don't recycle. Mm -hmm. When you take out things like old so now there's this huge pile of concrete bricks that could be broken up and made into aggregate so that we wouldn't have to dig up another earth in order to uh, replenish that. So there's, I don't know how what the percentage of that is. Uh, we tried to work with the citizens of Tully, we being a nation, in the late 90s to stop the gravel mine that is on that moraine. And unfortunately, you can't. The environmental conservation law in New York mandates the DEC promote and then regulate mining. No conflict there, right? Promote and then regulate. We've been involved in far too many gravel mines, far too many salt mines, and I've never seen any successful attempt to. Stop it. That doesn't mean, and because I'm talking with some of our neighbors about stopping the expansion of that gravel. It's just political. 
I'm disappointed to hear that that Corey. I thought they could still go deeper and that that's how they could get what they wanted. But I'm disappointed to hear that. So if, at least I'd like to know about it and see if there's if we could help in some way. Okay. That's that's great news. And the situation she is talking about is basically a follow-on to an expansion of that same quarry a number of years ago, where the changing seasons subdivision neighbors uh, attempted to oppose that quarry expansion because of the uh, political power and uh, longstanding association of the Kinsella operation with the town of Manlias. They were successful in, and I guess also uh, regarding the uh, state law that you just cited, uh, they, they were successful in expanding the quarry. The problem, of course, is instead of going deeper, they go wider and, and they run out of uh, stone and then they apply for an expansion of the uh, quarry, bringing up the same uh, uh, circumstance that existed years ago. Well, in I know there are people in Pompey that are all that happy with Consola either. Uh, well, who's happy to have a gravel mine next door growing? Uh, it's, but, it, and, uh, no, it's, it's unfortunate. I, I was struck by a teaching of Rita Jocks when she said that in what, discussing the good mind and gratitude, she talked about, we take what is given from the earth. We don't take what's underneath it <laughs> as a basic principle for how their worldview. Um, so that to me kind of points to the problems with this type of mining and the surface mining, it, as well as many others, but yeah. Well, fracking. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I had to learn about leases for that, but uh, no, I, yes, Katsala has a lot of power, but it's also that law. And, and maybe what we need to think about more broadly is changing that law and getting the state to say, you, you don't get an automatic presumption that you can, that you can mine. Because um, that's the problem. But a town does still have the right to say no. Well, that's complicated. Yes, if the town has acted early enough. So in Tully, Tully has that gravel mine. They fought it, we fought it with them, and we lost it. They had a law that was quite a, I forget this in the 90s, so the fact that I can even remember that, that something happened. Uh, but they, they had a good mining law. The law was challenged first by the mining company. They lost locally. They lost in the appellate division in Rochester. So the law is good. Then the mining company figured out that in one little corner of that area that they now mine, there had been prior gravel extraction. Oh, yeah. Grandfather did. Yeah. So, yeah, they'll go hire the Lombardi law firm and divorce it. They represent every gravel one. And, but again, with the legal concept of promote and regulate, that's what has to be changed. And, and I, I don't do a lot of work changing state laws because of, I'm not supposed to get involved in the outside government that much. It's up to the and, but that's really the problem. Yeah. That's the problem the law. And, and then once that gets into DEC's head there, uh, you know, every permit that DEC issues is permission to do something they shouldn't be doing. That's the nature of it. That is not fundamentally environmental conservation. Yeah. Exactly. 